I hope Walter Delamere knows, for he's been told often enough what a hold he has on our affection. Other poets may command our admiration and our interest, sometimes a rather disquieting interest, our respect, our puzzlement. But Mr. Delamere has got hold of our hearts. It's by no stranglehold. Rather, it is by something as delicate and insinuating as the tendrils of a plant. Each one fragile in itself, easily snapped, you might think, yet curiously wary and resistant. And in the aggregate of their little myriads, whispering, we hold you, we will not let you go. I doubt if even the scratchiest of our critics has ever made any rarely disagreeable remark about Mr. Delamere. He seems to have been born entirely deficient in the faculty of arousing animosity. They were all good fairies, without a single bad one at his christening. And they must have ordained, 80 years ago, in 1873, as they hovered round the font, that this tiny object should be destined to grow into the best-loved poet of 1953. A very long time for a poet to retain his popularity among his readers, and an even more remarkable length of time to retain the esteem of critics and reviewers, that fickle audience, always alive to new developments, and professionally and rightly frightened of missing anything new. Mr. Delamere keeps his position unassailed. It's very odd that he should do so, he has never been labelled with that now damning label, a Georgian, although chronologically he might deserve it. The pendulum of fashion has never swung against him, and that is one of the greatest gifts his godmothers at his baptism gave him, that fashion, that destructive dame, should pass him by. Or should we say, rather, that he avoided her, whenever their steps threatened to meet on the highway of the prevailing vogue. He skipped nimbly round the vast crinoline of her skirts with a courteous bow, since he is the best mannered and the most gentle, gentle mannerly of poets, and came out on the further side of the road, still tripping along on his own, doing what he wanted to do, and writing the poetry he wanted to write. And fashion is not for him. She may be a dictator, but some instinct tells him that her reign is short and ultimately doomed. He cannot be bothered with her. He must be independently himself. Now, this talk is not intended to suggest any critical estimate of Mr. Delamere's poetry. It's intended to suggest some picture of his personality. But how on earth or how on the air am I to do that? I don't know him very well. I wish I did. I can say only that whenever I have met him, I've had the impression of something intensely alive. Questing. Almost like a terrier rummaging through undergrowth and starting more game than one has conversationally time to pursue. From the moment when I first made his acquaintance, I felt that there was no subject on earth I couldn't discuss with him, from the pleasures of bird watching to the immortality of the soul. No personal experience with which I would not entrust him, confident of his instant understanding. And this first meeting uh, didn't take place, as you might think, sitting in the twilight over the embers of a wood fire, but at a London luncheon party where he happened to be my neighbour at the table. Most unpropitious on the face of it. And another curious thing about it was that he did not seem to be in the least out of place, although all that glitter and brilliance round him was surely incongruous as a setting to this poet of dreams. I came to the conclusion that he would not seem out of place anywhere. No more at a court ball than on the banks of a trout stream. 
and that the reason for this quiet assurance was precisely the same as for the security of his literary position, that he remained always unalterably himself. Gentle, and eager, and intensely sincere, he seemed incapable of any form of affectation or of altering his manner to suit his company. It was by no aggressive means that he imposed his personality. It was simply as though his own words, uttered in a different connection, were written all over him. That which I was, I am. And for this very reason, perhaps, he made conversation on the small talk level out of the question. He plunged straight in. Now, most people who plunge straight in are apt to be both tiresome and embarrassing. Mr. Delamere was neither. It was merely that he preferred to talk about the things that interested him, not laying down the law or egotistically forcing his own topics onto his companion, but taking you into his confidence, sharing his excitement with you, asking your opinion, and then suddenly illuminating the whole thing with a phrase of his own, often a phrase that might have gone unaltered into one of his own poems. I recollect that on that particular occasion, it was love that he started by discussing. For if I remember rightly, he was engaged at the moment on compiling an anthology about love. But his mind darted far too quickly for it to remain fixed for long on any one subject. He ran so rapidly along a kind of chain system of fuses, touching each one off as he went. Spurts of light which could have kindled bonfires had he allowed them time. He didn't allow them time. He allowed them to flutter only for a moment as fireflies tantalizing, provocative. And then they were away into the air, a squandered flock, gloriously wasteful, never to be recaptured and ever to be regretted. The offspring of a strange original mind. Would he be considered a good talker as Desmond McCarthy, for example, was recognized as a good talker. I should say, not in quite the same way. Walter Delamere's talk strikes one as so completely spontaneous, so unpremeditated. One can imagine him quite as happily conversing with a stray cat in a tool shed. He's so very far from being the professional conversationalist or raconteur. The most intrepid hostess couldn't imagine herself turning him on to hold the table as the meal drew towards its close. And indeed, those who've heard him lecture may have noticed a certain rigidity which accords ill with all that I've been saying. He's been compelled to prepare his lecture. The bird of a free fancy has been put into a cage. A free fancy. Yes, for his range includes fantasy, so closely bound up with his imagination, but never, never flippancy. That eagerness of his must be interpreted as the charming reflection of his underlying earnestness. Light, though his touch may be, and it is, a serious purpose lies behind it. And this is true of his personality, I think, no less than of his poetry. For if ever a mistake were more generally made over a poet, it is in the conception of Mr. Delamere as the poet of pretty and unreal fancies. Poet of dreams he may be, poet of childhood, poet of remote romantic places. But from the very beginning, it is easy to detect a sinister note even in the earliest volumes. I laid my inventory at the hand of death 
who in his gloomy arbor sat. That was published so long ago as 1906. And then six years later came the volume called The Listeners, containing what is surely one of the most suggestively alarming poems in the language. Is there anybody there, said the traveller, knocking on the moonlit door? Mystery is there, but it is not the shallow mystery produced by the setting of a haunted house within the forest, nor even by the extraordinary metrical craftsmanship and association of words which entitle this strange poem to be called flawless. It's not the decorative pictorial mystery such as a pre-Raphaelite poet might have produced. And there is quite a pre-Raphaelitish touch at moments about Mr. Delamere. It goes deeper than Keats in La Belle Dame Sans Merci, with which it has some affinity. And as for Edgar Allan Poe working along the same lines, it shows him up almost as a cheap, though clever, charlatan. This is only to say that the mystery of Mr. Delamere's listeners goes right down to the very bottom of the well. It concerns the essential questions and the problems that most deeply affect that happy minority who lead the thinking life. They breathe a different air. Not for them are the petty squabbles of daily life. Not for them the wrangle of party politics. Not for them the materialism of an industrialized, mechanized, stockbroking world. Walter Delamere himself has said that one may voyage far and perhaps in another real. He says real, you notice, not reality. For he is not concerned with what most of us choose to regard as reality, but only with the real as he himself conceives it to be, and as I suppose we should all conceive it to be, were we but gifted with the vision of a poet or of a mystic. This is leading me into rather deep and difficult waters, but I cannot avoid them when I have to speak of Walter Delamere, our gentle poet, my enchanting neighbour at the luncheon table, is really a dark angel in disguise. He coos with the voice of a turtle dove, and on his feet there are no claws, but he has a deep bass note in his throat, and his song is not always sweet. His song may even, at times, be alarming to those who don't like to penetrate beneath the surface of life. For Walter Delamere, far from being merely the writer of graceful lyrics, is the poet of terror. Let me repeat that, the poet of terror, the poet of alarm, the spokesman of everything that we have all from our childhood upwards been most frightened of, ghosts and the unexplained and the unknown. The spokesman of everything that we get more and more frightened of as the eventual mystery of death draws nearer because his major preoccupations are and always have been with the ultimate real, with time, past and present, through what wild centuries roves back the roads, with the human voyage through life as we know it, with death as we imagine it to be, with the ghostly hints of the life after death, as the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hoofs were gone, and with the dreadful loneliness which is each man's lot on his journey. That is a theme that has always haunted him, and which finds its supreme expression in the long poem called The Traveller, a symbolic narrative of a man's last ride across a grim, inhospitable desert with only his white Arab mare for company. And that poem was published when Mr. Delamere was already 73 years of age. And at first sight, it would appear as though he had himself travelled far, 
since the light-hearted frivolities of his uh, songs of childhood and of peacock pie. Until we remember, as I have suggested, that the Gravehound note was never absent, not even in the earliest days. It is this combination of a graceful vivacity, sheer high spirits, almost romping with fun, and a profound sense of the eventual mysteries that make of him so rare and important a poet. I think important is perhaps not a good adjective to apply to him. It suggests something portentous, which he never is, but let it stand. Had this profound and ever-present sense been lacking, he might have remained forever a minor poet. Charming, endearing, delicious, but minor in the sense that, say, Herrick is minor. Not all his lyrical afflatus could have carried him into the upper ranks, nor all his lovely use of language and intensely personal vision have advanced him beyond a small, though exquisite, niche in the temple of literature. For as it is, his awareness that more tigers than kittens prowl across our path, but perhaps I needn't labour the point. We only need to remember that the Shakespeare who wrote songs for Puck and for Ariel was also the Shakespeare who wrote King Lear. Now, am I hereby suggesting that Mr. Delamere should be regarded as a major poet? That would indeed be a big claim to make, even as an offering on his 80th birthday. And in any case, it's an estimate that must be left to posterity. But what we can say with assurance is, there is that there is not anyone else like him. He is, in the most correct sense of the word, unique. There is only one Walter Delamere. And yet there are two Walters Delamere, rarely, the lyrical and the tragic poet. And of the two, the tragic poet is surely the greater, since tragedy must always excel in the last resort. And how right was Lord David Cecil when he remarked that Mr. Delamere is occupied with nothing less than the ultimate significance of experience. And on that phrase, I think I might conclude, since it sums up everything that I've been trying to say. It takes me right back to the beginning of this talk, when I said that Mr. Delamere and the fashion of the moment could have nothing to do with one another. It takes me back to the observation that he must always be himself and nothing but himself. It takes me back to his own remark that one may voyage far and perhaps in another realm. And above all, talking about him like this for 20 minutes to goodness knows how many people and to what varying sorts of people who may never have met him in the flesh but who love him through his poetry. This, above all, takes me back to that London luncheon party where I first met him and recognized instantly that I was in the company of the rarest, finest, purest spirit and did you once see Shelley Plain? To whom I now send, with the deepest respect and gratitude, these birthday greetings. That talk by V. Sackville West was originally broadcast in the BBC third programme on Walter de la Mare's 80th birthday.